Hey, how's everyone doing out there tonight? Thanks for joining us for Bait Shop Talk Live. Uh, first off, before we kick off the show, I just want to say our, our prayers are with all the folks over in North and South Carolinas during the storm. Uh, I just hope everyone's doing okay. If we got any viewers from North and South Carolina tonight, our thoughts are definitely with you. We hope that you and your family are okay. And uh, tonight, uh, Timmy couldn't be with us tonight. He had surgery on his eyes, so if he did join us tonight, he'd be over here looking like Stevie Wonder. He wouldn't know if he was live or not or if he was even on the screen. So, yeah, like what Bubba's doing. So, Timmy couldn't join us tonight, so filling in for Timmy was our special guest from last episode, uh, Alex with 904 Fishing. What's going on, everybody? Alex, good to have you back. And with always with us, who's always fashionably, is Bubba. I don't, I'm, I'm here. I don't know. I mean, I'm on time. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm talking about your last video, that big sun hat and a mullet just a flowing out the back. Yeah, that's it. That's I, I was telling Tim, I was like, look, man, I, I'm messing with him after uh, after I was tearing up the reds. If you guys hadn't seen that, me and Tim just went red fishing last weekend. And uh, I was like, all right, I'll tell you the secret. You got to have two hats. You got to have a bass hat and a red hat. And it's my red hat. You know, that's true. I make fun of you about that, but I have the same. I have my kayak fishing hat that I use for saltwater, which is a full brim hat that I used to wear when I was in Iraq. And then I got my bass hat, which is a regular ball cap that usually has Vexen on it nine times out of ten. Well, that's the that's the secret, guys. If y'all y'all ever needed to know, there it is. Get you a different hat. Yeah, if you don't think fishermen are superstitious, try to bring bananas in somebody's boat or take their lucky hat from them. No, we don't have a problem. <laughs> Right. Can't, can't have bananas in the boat. All right. I guess uh, let's just jump right into it. We'll go into the fishing report. Saltwater. Saltwater has been doing really good. The mullet run is in full effect. There are mullet everywhere. I'm talking everything from perfect little three to four inch uh, finger mullet, which is why I like to use for bait for flounder and reds, all the way up to the big hog leg mullet like you can use for uh, sharks and tarpon. So you definitely have the variety in the creeks and in the river. And I believe the pogies are still off the beach as well, last I heard. Uh, freshwater, it's been a mixed bag. Uh, I've been fishing Robin. I mean, you guys know from my one of my last videos, I've been fishing Robin. Uh, I tried to get out in St. John's, but I wasn't able to do that. It seems to be hit or miss. They're definitely in uh, transitions is what they're focusing on. So if you can find an area where it's like a hump, and there's deeper water next to it, or let's, it, it doesn't have to be out in open water. It can just be a hump along the bank. Like you'll see a mound of grass, like an island of grass, and this open water behind it. And that little pocket, you'll find bass up in there. If you watch my video where I'm throwing the frog, most of my bites came in the open pocket behind the pads, not in the pads. Uh, get out of the house, go fishing. Thanks for joining us, man. Glad you made it. I know a lot of us are still watching the Jag game. And speaking of which, touchdown Jaguars. There we go. Yeah, like we let the uh, Patriots come back, and now we just answered. Now it's 31-13 uh, for those that are missing the Jaguar game. We don't need a repeat of the championship game, so good. Get on them. Oh, man. Uh, no offense to any – I don't think we even have any New England people here that watch the show. But if you come across here and you're from New England, I'm sorry, I can't stand the Patriots. Anyway, we're getting way off topic. This is turning in from Bait Shop Talk to ESPN. I know, uh, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> what is it talking about? Oh, I tried fishing deep. Uh, couldn't get any bass deep. It seems like all my bites came shallow. Um, everyone I've talked to so far, you would think during the summertime, if you watch all the YouTube experts out there that fish, you know, in Texas, they're like, oh, fish deep. Summertime, all the bass are deep. Uh <laughs> It hasn't been my experience. All my bass I've caught so far have been anywhere from two to four feet of water. Uh, maybe it's just the Floridian in me, and like I like to hit the bank. Uh, I did he I did catch some deep water fish, and we'll get into that more when we get to the tournament section. So, Bobby, you want to take it away? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, so we've we've been dealing with weird weather here, where today it is. I don't know. They, they were saying on the Jag game at kickoff, it was 97 degrees at the field down there. Uh, we had like a full solid week where it was the mid 80s. And, uh, you know, of course, I had to jump on bass fishing with that. 
uh, finally cooling off a little bit. Water temp was down to mid upper eighties. Uh, two weeks ago, that's that's when I was bass fishing there. Caught seven, eight, and a few hours. Um, everything was two to three pound range. It was pretty healthy. Surprisingly, coming out of summer, they're usually skinny as can be. Uh, did did pretty good with that. It was all you know skinny water too. I mean, I was I was in the kayak when I did that. It was. Uh, early morning you know once the sun got up everything died off and it got hot um you know it's uh, it been creek fishing for bass well i've got to say for bass fish brackish water a couple times in the creeks and um you know the water temp was still down from what it was uh didn't catch much you know caught the stray one here and there but every time i went creek fishing my focus was wasn't really on bass we started out the day red fishing um uh, and then kind of switched to bass later on. And so I wasn't really expecting much for bass there. Creek fishing for, uh, for reds has been fantastic though. Um, you know, it's what, like Joe was saying, saltwater in general has been great. Uh, the creek fishing for reds has been fantastic. Uh, me and if you hadn't seen that, uh, I know a lot of you guys are subscribed to both of us. Me and Timmy went out uh, last weekend because he's been on this, you know, he caught his first red the week before then wanted to go red fishing with me. I was like, yeah, man, we'll go. Uh, I caught a 26, a 21, a couple dinks. He caught, I think it was like a 19 or something like that. Uh, and then he was tearing the bass up. Uh, but I mean, it was upper, you know, slot red just destroyed my reel. If you guys hadn't seen that video, you got to see it. It was absolutely ridiculous. Rusty V was saying the recover after the real, the real issue was awesome. It was, I thought I was going to lose it. I mean, I was, uh, I, I'm amazed at what happened there. I lost the, uh, I set the hook on this big old red stone of spook early and, uh, set the hook on that big old red and I lost the anti reverse bearing on my reel. Now I'm going to this old cheap reel, one of my saltwater things that I didn't mind that I tore the reel up, but you know, so he starts running. I'm backlashed. I'm wrapped around my rod tip. There's all hell is breaking loose. Uh, we're getting the boat drifting back into the trees because it's a hard incoming tide. About lost the GoPro in the water. Uh, and then got it all untangled. He starts running and pulling drag again. And then he wraps me around a crab track. Uh, finally get it out of the crab trap. Finally get, get him up, you know everything squared away and then i got to teach timmy on the fly how to fold out a fold out net i mean it just folds up and lock it into place but i had to tell him how to do that while i'm trying to hold this thing by the front grip so the reel doesn't come backwards and just roll free spin backwards get them in there and uh in the process of getting them unhooked i dumped three different rods in the water saved them all thank goodness but it was just a horrible mess but the moral of that story is uh creek fishing is good <laughs> it's good right now big reds uh Alex, what about you? I know you went out to the uh, the inlet out farther, closer to, I mean, not really surf fishing, but close to the surf. I don't know if you've been surf fishing at all really lately, but how was the inlet? Uh, the inlet yesterday was, uh, the, that's when I went out. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, I've learned, um, because I've not been a huge saltwater kayak angler, uh, I've learned that tides are important. You have to learn your tides. You have to time your tides. If not, uh, you will have either a horrible day of fishing or an absolute awesome day of fishing and that's that that's been my two experiences uh experiences this year is i had a really really bad day of fishing where i only got one fish in eight hours and then i uh had a great day of fishing and i slotted out on my reds um and almost did a slam in just under three hours so it all depends you know what kind of bait you're using who you know where where you are timing the tides and knowing what to do and where to throw it Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and you're talking about Fort George Inlet, of course, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. stopping yeah. grounds yeah. of our friend get out of the house and go fishing. Yeah. 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 You, you might see him out there. There's a good chance he's always out there. Uh, I mean, that's, I always call the inlet because it's just the most frequent inlet that I go to to fish. But yeah, that's there's, what I'm talking about. There's Sorry. also Nassau Sound. I know. And I know. If, you, if you can get out there on a good day, I, if you want to hook into a tarpon, that'd be your best spot. There's a lot of mullet schooling out there, and every person I've seen that's been fishing the uh, bridge there has been seeing tarpon rolling every day now for probably the last month, if not more. So we definitely need to get our ad together, all of us, and get out there and soak some mullet and either catch us a big old shark or a tarpon. Either way, a bucket list kind of fish. Mm-hmm. 
Apparently, they're all over Dr. Zinlet, too, because about every one of Alex's video, as I see, there's some tarpon rolling in the background behind him. Right. Yep. He's like, can someone tell me what these are? And like, I wanted to be like, it's Loch Ness Monster. Man. That's a shark. Listen, shark. listen. That first video when I was magnet fishing, all right, I saw two different fish. I've gone back. I've looked at the footage. One was a big jack. One was a big tarpon. Everyone kept telling me it was a tarpon, but I saw two fish. That, that, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well they uh they get up i haven't been in there i thought about going i didn't have the chance to yesterday i had to go into work but i thought about going into mill cove they get in the mill cove this time of year too uh once they if they're pushed all the way up into uh doctor's inlet i'm sure they're in mill cove as well hey little roy's on here how about them jags that's right how about them yeah jags? that's right 31 13 still we got three minutes left in the fourth so hopefully they can seal the deal i i really would hope they wouldn't let them come back on that much so bob would you get anything your mystery tackle box this month yeah uh as i didn't even tell you about this i uh, was new to the other day so i switched over because we have all been on this uh saltwater kick here recently because it's so freaking hot and hard to bass fish i switched over to uh the saltwater edition for this month Perfect. and uh well, well, for like you told me when I first started with it, I'm not very happy with it. I'm switching back to the bass one next month. But let's dig into it here, and I'll show you what I was disappointed with. Come on, uh, make all those nine-year-olds proud on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, you know, they got whatever brand that is of the uh, Fish Bites thing. Whatever. House, uh, brand, house brand Fish Bites. Yeah. You know, uh, that's usable uh suspending uh i'm guessing from suspending it's a jerk bait but it looks like a crankbait lip uh that's usable though well i mean what, what in the world guys come on hey it glows in the dark yeah uh, not too cool there uh some jewelry some bling hey uh, there you go there's something for alex and timmy i'm sure they'll take that off your hands <laughs> yeah you guys can have those now, now the tourist this rigs I'm not sure how I feel about this now. I, I did not know that big bite baits, like I, I'll get big bite baits a lot. Now, big bite baits is a, uh, they're a cheap brand of soft plastics and they are pretty much direct knockoffs of other baits. I mean, just like exact copies of them. Like I use their, I got a hundred pack of stick baits, a hundred pack of a creature thing because they're cheap and they're pretty much exact knockoffs of something else. Now this one, I, I'm interested. I'm going to use it. And, you know, so it is a shrimp with like these weird little tails on the end of it. It's uh, I mean, the rest of it looks like every other kind of shrimp, except it's got like these two floppies at the front, which are, you know, kind of cool. But I'm interested to see what that does. Can't be bad. But, I, you know, that one was kind of cool. I didn't even know Big Bite Mates made that. And of course, they're fortified with bite juice and bite juice smells a lot like soft plastic. Didn't know if you guys knew that. It smells, ah, oh, that bite juice. Yeah, it smells like soft plastic, like plastic salt. Uh, but, I mean, that was probably the only cool thing that, that I really got out of it was the Big Bite Baits shrimp. Uh, we'll, we'll see how they go. Um, switching back to the Bass Box next month, though. Well, it could, can, be like, it could be like Gambler. It smell like pickles. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. But, yeah, I'm switching back to the Bass Box next month. I like the Bass Boxes. I've had good luck with those. Saltwater Box, first one I got. Not too impressed with it. Um, you know, I just bought a pack of Z Man shrimps the other day that uh, are going to work better than those, I can tell you that. And the rest of that stuff, I'm probably not going to use. When, it's, when, it's, when it comes to shrimp lures, I uh, generally use only two. I stick with the good old DOA shrimp. That's like my go to if I'm really like, especially, especially the glow in the dark color yep. or what they call like a cotton shrimp, which is got gold flake on the bottom. And like the glow in the top on the back, those seem to be two really good colors, and they they kill the trout around here. If you ever could do some night fishing for trout, that glow in the dark shrimp is like perfect. It's like money. And then of course the uh, second shrimp that I would, my choice would be of course gulp shrimp, either yeah. in um, new penny or like uh, pearl with neon tail. Those are my really two shrimp imitation choices, which those should be running too right about now. I know. I think they're catching them a little bit smaller. I don't know if the bigger ones have moved in yet. They have not. No, that's that's been the the comments that I've heard is that they are surprisingly not in for this time of year. Like it's less than normal. Um, now on this spoon, guys. Um, so there's this. 
if you want to fish a spoon for reds, of course, it's no surprise. If you don't know about that, you should. It's a uh, Johnson Silver Minnow. Now, I know that's gold. That's the redfish color. Still called a Silver Minnow. Don't do not do this kind of thing. Get, get rid of that. Get get that out of here. Go get a couple of these. Go get a couple of those. That's save, how you do it. Save those for your salmon fishing expedition when you go up north. Seriously, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> right. uh, I guess we'll move on to tournaments. Uh, it seems like when the summer gets here, the tournaments seem to slow down because one, you don't want to keep the bass in a live well of when it's 97 degrees outside and the water is going to be just as hot. We want, we want to try to keep them alive. So uh, my last tournament I had was on Kingsley Lake on a uh, camp landing, and it was a night tournament. And Kingsley Lake is just one big giant grassy swimming pool it's like really clear and it's just like perfect circle and it this goes into our next topic it's also a happening party spot too sadly so while you're trying to fish if you guys ever seen any of my kingsley videos you're out there fishing but there's 20 million jet skiers and wakeboarders and it's it's a small lake but you'll have people out there with center consoles and twin outboards I, pulling tubes and stuff around so you're having to deal with that during the day that's why we try to have our tournaments at night so you think you would escape some of that, but no, there is some guys still out there at wake boats until like six in the morning when we were getting ready to go. Our tournament was from seven PM to seven AM. Uh the guy that won it won it with twenty six pounds. And he did that Ooh. with help yeah, he did that with help of an eleven pounder that he caught. They caught eleven Lord. pounder and they caught a, a nine pounder. a uh, different guy called nine pounder. The biggest bass caught was eleven pounds. And it was like in thirty six feet of water. So I was not fishing deep enough, but that's the way Kingsley fishes. If you ever get a chance to fish Kingsley, don't you're not going to get nothing around the bank. You got to go deep. Uh, they were schooling out there, but the ones that were schooling were their typical little one pound bass, and they were schooling up on these uh, small minnows, and they were shallow. And I was even throwing a shaky head at them, which looks nothing like a minnow, and they were still eating it. So <laughs> they definitely are there. Uh, but I caught most of mine on the deep grass anywhere from 12 to 17 feet deep and the key to that catching them in the grass you couldn't just pull in the middle of the grass bed they were right on the edge on the outside edge where it was went from a heart you know grass to sand they were right there just falling along that edge and the only thing i could get in a bite was a shaky head uh finesse worm and i just throw it along the bottom of that and then they, you feel the thump and you bite a bass up from 17 feet of water uh, my partner, the biggest bass he got was about three pounds. The biggest bass I got was about two pounds. And but there's truly some monsters in that lake. As the guys that won and came in the second place, proven that you just everybody's got their own little secret numbers out there. That's the thing. So and everybody has their own wrecks. They had a, a big event out there that night too. Uh, so about five o'clock in the morning, we saw these giant stadium lights come on. We didn't know what the heck was going on. Like man, they're really throwing down for this way in, you know. But uh, they turned out to have some kind of Iron Man backpack event going on. That's what it was, and that was the starting point. We heard music blaring. So you're trying to catch bass. It's 5 o'clock in the morning when it should be absolutely quiet, and there's whiteboard boats and an Iron Man competition with a DJ booth going on, you know? Hey, you talk uh, about uh, the shaky head, though. That's one of my, uh, like, summertime kind of secrets. If nothing else is working for summertime, you, you know, obviously switch over to finesse stuff because it's so hot. Uh, shaky head. I've got. I'm sitting on video or of of one where I went out to uh, the Goodbies, was throwing everything under the sun, couldn't catch anything. Switched over to shaky head, caught like seven in an hour. I mean, everything was small, but that's that's one of those summer kind kind of things. Uh, the shaky head. It was my first time actually catching a bass on a shaky head. Normally, I never uh, threw one before, so I needed like. Drop shot wasn't working. The weight kept getting caught up in the grass. So the grass was about a foot and a half deep. And so you'd go to pull the drop shot, and you didn't know if you had a fish or you're just pulling it out of the grass. So I went something more direct, and I went on with a shaky head. Uh, for those that don't know what a shaky head is, and I bet it'd also be great for salt water too. You know, it kind of looked like an eel down there or something. It's just a basic jig head with a hook, but it has like a corkscrew on top of the jig head, and you twist your worm onto it, hold it, and then you just kind of rig it where it's weedless. And so basically you're throwing a little jig head with a finesse worm about, I don't know, about five inches, about four or five inch worm. And I was just hopping along the bottom. And it's a real finessey when bass are kind of slow 
uh, presentation from when they're, you know, they they don't really go for it, but it's kind of like us. If, you know, someone throws a, you know, in my case, like a pinwheel next to me, and I don't really feel like a steak, I'll eat that. It's just right there and it's tasty. So it's the same kind of way for a bass. He might not feel like a T-bone, but, you know, he might eat a, a potato chip. So that's basically what you're putting out in front of him. Yeah, and it's like a uh, like it stands up too. So whenever you know you throw it, and it's you, you're really just kind of twitching it, and like it's it, they like to sit at like a forty five degree angle most of the time, and it just sits there and shakes. It's why it's called a shaky head. Uh, right, it's basically sitting there on the bottom, waving high to the yeah. bass, like like it looks like there. like something nose down feeding, um, you know, and it's kind of sw- wiggling to keep nose down, uh, right. and it. it it's real, real good finesse. Whenever, uh, like that's 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 the first one you've ever pulled out on it. That's really one of my like last resorts. Like if nothing else is working, uh, all right, here comes the shaky head, and it usually does pretty well. Well, if nothing else is working for me, you know, I'm pulling out the speed worm. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, that's something I want to try to play with. Uh, I want to try some freshwater baits, like bass type lures, uh, in salt water. Like I, I think it was get out the house, go fishing. Was talking about if you use a bass frog and salt water works real good. It's kind of like that all body mullet that live target sells. I want to try that. Like a you know, like a blue or silver looking frog. I know they got some that are like a blue. I think they call it like blue shad color. Try that shaky head idea. I would think an Alabama rig in salt water would kill some sea trout during the winter because it, it's some oh, school yeah. bait fish like a school mullet coming through. I think That's- I would. I haven't heard of anyone ever doing it. If you look at YouTube and you type in Alabama rig saltwater, you won't find it. No, no one's ever done it, and I don't know why. I mean, if it would work for bass, why wouldn't it work for redfish or trout? But I was throwing uh, throwing the double plopper this morning. Uh, I was bass fishing a little bit, like shore fishing this morning, throwing the double plopper, and I, I wasn't didn't really like it too much for bass, but I could see absolutely where that would work in saltwater because it looks like a little you know mini school with something running. Yeah, that's what I was saying. We got uh, some folks joining in from Utah asking about carp fishing. Uh, not too many carp here in Florida. Most carp we have, like we were saying in the comments, are, are grass carp. And uh, I don't think it, uh, the only time I've ever seen a common carp caught was when I was in Mississippi where a friend of mine actually snagged one with a chatterbait. And it looked more like a giant goldfish than in, uh, a common carp. So uh, not too many carp around here but I, I like if anybody else is a fan of his channel catfish and carp on oh, yeah. youtube i watch him yeah. all the time he's over in tokyo catching them right now just a big piece of bread yeah <laughs> yeah that's all we got to grass carp now i have seen guys bow fish for those grass carp though yeah so like they'll do the same for mullet you know, a big giant mullet like you see in the springs they both fish for them and tilapia yeah, I was thinking about rigging up a. Uh, if you've ever seen those guys do like a wrist rocket bow fishing, I was thinking about rigging one of those up. Yeah, I, th- I think what was it like a Hawaiian sling. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, same kind of concept. All right, yeah. see, uh, we got twelve people here joining us today, guys. Don't be shy. Go here and get over in that chat. You know, let us know where you're watching this from today and how you came across this. You know, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I've called Crappie on Black Creek. Uh, Black Creek, me and Bubba have about the same opinion of Black Creek, at least when it comes to bass fishing. Well, I mean, it seems like they're either there or they're not, you know. Well, then again, what was it? It was like wintertime when we fished. I don't know. It was still kind of chilly. Yeah, it was. It's it's Black Creek is one of those kind of like extreme kind of creeks where you got to figure out. It, they have to be in the right part of like their transition, it seems like, to be in there real thick where because it drops off so fast you're dealing with like a real short shallow spot and then a steep drop off and it seems like they're either in there or they're not if you're at you know like the right time that's that's been my experience either i've been in there and caught them great or been in there and barely caught anything uh yeah guys if you're new to uh join us the bait shop talk live if you leave something in the comment it's going to take a minute for us to get to it because there's a delay from uh google hangout to youtube so that's why you know if you say something it takes us just, just a second to get to it uh boat update later or not old timmy's doing pretty good uh when i had her at the robin i got her up to three-quarter throttle now i can get up to about 42 43 miles an hour or so yay we're getting that much closer where i can start running at wide open throttle again 
and actually get somewhat kind of speed. I mean, I can't compete with the guys that have the 250 outboards, but you know, it's not it's nicer than going faster than the trolling motor for once and uh, be able to cover some ground and get to some spots that you know I see on Google Earth. So that's where we're at on the boat. I think uh, Bubba's got his boat kinks kind of fixed out for the most part. I know him and Timmy was out in it. And uh, yep. there's all kind of the chaos from that between hooks and legs and getting wrapped around crab trap. <laughs> yeah, he hooked himself in the leg with that. He, uh, he's got a habit of letting stuff kind of flop around a little bit. And, you know, he brought the red in and dropped it on the deck back there and let it do a little flopping around. So the, the fish actually got his revenge on him and hooked him right in the quad. Uh, <laughs> but but as far as uh, boat goes, yeah, uh, been been perfect, no issues. Everything's been great there. Good deal, good deal. Glad to hear it. Uh, rain. I know we we were getting it like every day there for a while, but now it seems like we're going through a little drought. Uh, side note: Congratulations to the Jaguars. They won thirty-one thirteen. Uh, yes. Game's over, so everybody come check out Face Shop Talk. Tell your friends. Game's over. You don't need to be watching the TV no more. We know who won. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we were talking about uh, the rain. It was raining every single day, and then it stopped. Now we're going through like a little dry spell, kind of. Uh, I kind of wish we'd bring the rain back. Uh, rain. We're going to talk about how rain affects fishing. For me, it, it can be a double-edged sword. During the summertime, rain is a good thing because it cools that surface water temperature, and it makes it more comfortable for the fish to come up and start being more aggressive in attacking baits. So let's say you had a water temperature of, I've seen it this high this year, it's like 90 degrees. That rain may drop it down to about 84, which is more comfortable for fish to come up, get some moving more, get some more active, just like us. We're more active outside when the temperature is like, you know, mid 70s versus 97, like it has been lately. As fish are no different, they're gonna be the same way. Now, a different note to that, like, like I said, being a double-edged sword, if you're fishing a small body of water, I mean, even if uh, it's just a canal off of a larger body of water, and, this, and I had this happen to me in Okeechobee, we went down like late winter, in, you know, February, March, around that, I think, it, yeah, it was March. So it was still kind of chilly. It was in the 40s at night, and I was catching them. I caught them real good in a canal the first day. Well, it rained that night. And it dropped the temperature by like six degrees in that canal just by it raining, which totally shut the fish off. And I had to go back out to the main lake to find fish, where before it was the opposite. The bass were up in that canal for cooler water. And when it rained, it cooled it down. So the wintertime, rain is bad. Uh, summertime, rain is good. That's basically how it works. Uh, it gets some movement, it oxygenates the water. It gets a little bit of disruption, makes it a little murkier, harder for them to see your line and your hook. And like I said, when it's summer, when it's like the winter time, or fall, or early spring, that rain can, can damage you. Uh, guys, what have you noticed about it? Anything to throw in on that? Yeah, uh, you know, with mine to kind of add, I've, I've noticed you know about the same as what you said there. Uh, but one of the the favorite things, I mean, everybody knows that you know I'm a shallow backwater kind of guy anyway. Uh, one of my favorite kind of things about rain is whenever you know the water level rises and everything floods out. Uh, this is for salt and fresh. Uh, anything that's going to be shallow like that's going to start exploring that kind of new ground that's underwater, looking for if it's salt, looking for all those fiddler crab holes that are not usually underwater, a little bit higher in the grass than normal. Uh, so all your bait fish get pushed up in there and fresh water they're looking for all this kind of bugs and stuff that all get you know whenever that stuff floods out a lot so i love and it's been like joe was saying it drops the temperature uh it's more oxygen so that stuff that's coming in that's right there at the surface that's higher water level than normal um you know it's it's real good shallow fishing uh if it's right around the time of rain uh love top water over stuff like that you know where you're fishing like basically new new wet ground uh that's that's got the water level up alex what about you in the rain man um coming from a predominantly bank angler you know background when i was younger and not having access to a boat or anything uh rain is it can either really help like in the middle of the summer uh when it's you know water temperatures reaching 9500 degrees you know on the top of the water 
if it rains a little bit, if it rains for 20 minutes to about an hour, and it'll cool it off just a little, the bite might pick up a little from what I've seen. Um, but if it rains for any longer than that, the water's going to get murky, fishing's going to shut off, conditions are going to be bad. So it just seems hit or miss. Uh, so I'll usually, if it starts raining, I'll wait it out for about uh, 30 minutes. But then if it gets any worse, or if it continues raining, I'll usually leave because it's not going to be worth it. Just had to uh, get out the house and go fish and ask me, do you pay attention to the uh, barometric pressure? I know a lot of people have it on their, on their phone. And what he's referring to, barometric pressure, for those that don't know, generally a uh, falling barometric pressure gets the fish more active and gets them feeding and they're more likely to bite versus a high barometric pressure, like after a cold front comes through, they generally to be more sluggish and kind of sit in one spot and really don't want to bite. And I don't pay attention to the barometer. I know it sounds corny, but I pay attention to the weather for that day. Uh, like I was explaining to him in the comments, if you guys read, and I'm still going into some other stuff. If there's just like you go out and it's just a partly cloudy day, and all of a sudden, like the wind picks up, and you can just see a big bank of clouds come rolling in, and the rain starts hitting, then that means that pressure's dropping. You have uh, a front coming in, or you know, just a storm. And I've been out on a lake and had that happen to me, and it seems like every cast, if you're where the fish are, you're going to get hit every cast because they just go into, like, feeding frenzy mode. Now, on the back side of that storm, after it goes through and it clears out, and there's not a cloud in the sky. It's just bright sun or what I call high skies where the clouds are really high in the atmosphere. It's like them long, drawn-out, kind of hazy-looking clouds. That's a high-pressure day. You're going to have... You go with the fish really slow and throw more like finesse type bait because those bass are going to be real inactive and they're going to lock down to a uh, related structure. And when I say related structure, I mean like a pylon, rocks, like hard structure, concrete. Uh, when me and Bubba went out early in the season on the St. John's, concrete was key. All the concrete docks had fish on them. We threw in grass, we threw in eelgrass, we threw in. Full rushes can get a bite. Come to a concrete piling, bam, fast. That's just they seem to relate to hard structure like that when it's high pressure. That's that's what I've noticed so far. So that that hope that explains uh, barometric pressure a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of like you, where you know I watch the weather as much as anything. I'm I I try to be very minimalist on how much I rely on electronics. Uh, you know, I try to use them as little as possible and almost kind of supplement whatever I'm feeling, if you will, uh, fishing by feel, uh, you know, because we don't, that's probably why we, you know, we don't do a whole lot of like offshore deep water stuff. We do, you know, river primarily. Uh, Joe does more lakes than, you know, than I do because of the tournament stuff. Uh, but, you know, the vast majority of mine is either, the St. John's River or a creek off the St. John's River, uh, whether that's salt or freshwater. So as much as anything, I'm, I'm trying to go off of fields and not use electronics much because I'm not over open water where I'm just looking down at, you know, at water and trying to read it off my electronics. Uh, so I watch the weather on it, too. And you, you kind of see that kind of pattern. Uh, like he was talking about when we were fishing black and everything was on concrete. We really did. We tried everything. We tried wooden docks. We tried metal bulkheads, uh, grass, cattails, uh, you know, like kind of standing timber stuff. I mean, it was just just that concrete was the, the ticket that day. But it's, you know, you kind of find that pattern uh, and then try to figure out how that relates to the weather and then go off of it from there. Yeah, in our case, uh, the concrete was absorbing what heat there was, and that was the warmest thing around, which was – going through and heating up the water. So the bass were going to it kind of like we would go to a, a wood burning stove if we was at a hunt camp or somewhere and it was cold outside. You know, you're going to go to wherever the heat was. So that's pretty much what the bass were doing. And all of a sudden, oh, look, you know, here comes the swim jig. So that's how that went. And uh, speaking of using electronics and everything, I know I'm pretty heavy electronics. Uh, I have a hummingbird on the bass boat. I got a little Lowrance on the... Uh, on the kayak and I use them for various things, mostly for water temperature, of course, and then the, uh, the depth I'm in and 
if there's any fish, like when it comes to saltwater, uh, if you can find a deep hole, it seems like that's where they hang out at. And you can use that electronic to see if anybody's home or not. That way you know where they're not to waste your time. And I know a lot of people don't have that kind of electronics. They don't have a boat. They don't have something permanent. Maybe they, you know, they rent a boat or they buddy a, uh, borrow a buddy's kayak or they don't even have anything. They just fish from the bank. So that's why I'm going to turn it over to uh, Alex because he used to feel staff for a very nifty little invention called the Deeper. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It basically looks like an eight ball that you use in pool and you tie it onto your reel and you throw it out and it's kind of, it gives you sonar images to having a a screen locked to your boat you got it on your phone and you carry it anywhere i mean is that kind of pretty simplified alex yeah that's uh that, that's pretty much it it's a uh it's a it's a portable sonar you know it's the deeper smart sonar but they're portable and it's literally just a little handheld he's right you know it's it's about the size of a pool ball uh i would kind of relate it to that but uh, it's, it's it's small doesn't weigh a lot. You can cast it out. Uh, they've got a uh, arm attachment that you can put on your kayak. Um, they've got a new one out now that attacks to the gear tracks, and it's got uh, three hinges on it now, so or two hinges on it where the deeper attaches. So even if you rock in your kayak or your John boat or whatever boat you got, um, you know you've got you've got the deeper in the water, and uh, just connects right to your phone. And I, I really enjoy it because as a bank angler, um, prim primarily, you know, I'm getting more into kayak fishing because now I have that freedom to. But now as a uh, predominantly, um, or, you know, as, as I was a bank angler and I still am, you know, primarily, uh, it, re it really helps because I can go to all these different places. You know, I can go to that pond that's behind the bank or I can go to that pond that's, you know, next to the warehouse or something. I can cast out and I can see, okay, there's structure here. There's nothing here it's too hot you know i'm i'm only in a foot of water that's why i'm not catching anything you know there, there's just there's things uh that, that i can tell me and i can create my own uh, bathymetric maps off of it that's really nice to do i can pull that up later i can pull it up on my computer to look at it i can you know share with my friends i've put it in my videos a lot if you guys have seen my videos you know i'll record my screen i'll show you what i'm doing but it's great if you don't have, you know, the, 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 the big, you know, hummingbirds or the, the other big, you know, boat sonars or anything, and you just need something quick and portable that you can uh, detach and take with you or charge or whatever. That's what I was going to ask. So it does do that. Like you can map a body of water with it and then yeah. go back and look at it. Later. Okay. Cause I was, yeah. I was completely personal with, uh, you know, without regards to the stream. Cause I was thinking about grabbing one because I do so much kayak stuff. And, you know, like I'll poke around with a lot of bank stuff when I can. Uh, but that was that was my question is if you can do that, because I know I think their competition doesn't do that. Um, yeah, I've actually done a uh, comparison video um, that, that's on my Sorry? channel. Yeah, I've done a comparison video between the uh, the deeper, uh, the deeper pro, I believe. Um, or maybe it was I don't know uh, the deeper. I want to say the deeper 3.0 and the eye bobber. Um, <laughs> And I uh, used a um, don't I'm pretty sure that was a, yeah the deeper deeper 3.0 and the eye bobber yeah uh, but I, I used both of them and I you know looked at them same body of water same day same everything same conditions and um, in my experience uh, I, I would definitely go with the deeper um, just because it, it gives you more information. And I like having that as an avid angler. Um, of course, they do have like the start now that they've just come out with. And that is, you know, super easy to use. You just attach it to your phone, cast it out. It shows you, you know, bottom contour and uh, stuff of that nature as well as fish. So it's easy. But if you, I've got the Pro Plus and I can do um, onshore GPS, which means I can cast it out. And then as I'm reeling it in, it actually maps it as I'm reeling it in. So I don't have to, you know, uh, move around myself. But, uh, yeah, I, I've got a couple of bathymetric maps that, uh, like, I can go and pull it up on my computer and um, see, uh, you know, the, the areas of Doctor's Lake that I've uh, mapped out. I can see areas in Indiana where I've mapped out and Tennessee where I've mapped out because I've taken this thing as I've traveled. And uh, it's, it's a really good uh, comparison to have, especially after the hurricane uh, hit last year. No, I after, bet. Yeah. After, yeah, after Irma hit, all of my spots, nothing was working. Uh, all my usual stuff, which I was kind of mad about because I had, you know, been spending the last seven, eight years learning, you know, these certain bodies of water. And then Ermin came by and, you know, completely changed the contour and the bottom and the sandbars and the, the beds. Everything was changed. So I had to go back out, learn everything, and it made it a lot quicker so I could see all that on my phone. And I didn't have to worry about, you know, spending an arm and a leg to find that out.
Trust me, you ain't the only one that Irma messed up. Uh, I finally learned how to fish the St. John's River and fish in eelgrass, and then Irma <laughs> came through and got rid of all the eelgrass. So now wrecked I got to start all. all over learning the St. John's <laughs> River again. Yeah, but, wrecked uh, it all. Right, wrecked it all. Well, but uh, you're talking about the eye bobber and the deeper. But mm-hmm. my comparison with it is, is the deeper actually looks like a fish finder. Like it actually shows the contours and the fish, you know, look like, uh, you know, you can see the soft and hard bottom and everything. Whereas the eye bobber, it kind of looks like a game you would play on your phone. It looks kind of cartoony, you know, yeah. like, like, <laughs> like the actual weeds. And I feel like I'm playing, a, like I was playing a video game. That's why I, I didn't like it. I'm yeah. so used to uh, looking at a hummingbird or Lorantz and, you know, actual system. That's yeah. why, you know, I, I would favor the deeper if I was looking for that, if I didn't already have stuff on my uh, equipment. But like you said, you being a bank fisherman, that works great for you. It's like mm-hmm. Bubba's doing some night fishing. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> Thank God we see the glow. Now you kind of look like a, uh air traffic controller sitting in the dark. Yeah, the power go out? What happened? No, nah, well, my light bulb up there went out, I think. Really? Got all time behind, for yeah. the light bulb to go out. Of course, Jason right? Fine. Thanks for joining us, man. What's going on? Where was you at the beginning of the show? I know where you're at. You're watching the Jaguar game, probably. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's where he's at. Each and every one of you guys, thank you all for joining us. We love having you here every second Sunday of the month. We love having you here for Bait Shot Talk. And we got, you know, graced with Alex's presence again. So that's really awesome. <laughs> So, redfish fever, I think we've all caught it. It's safe to say that. Yep. I think every, yeah. what's funny is, is every one of us here have been killing the redfish this year. Mm. Or not this year, but this month. It is, they have turned on and they are hot. They're everywhere right now. Yeah, they're not messing around. Yeah. Uh, well, well what, you guys are the ones that got me off my butt to get the kayak out there in the salt water. Like, Tim went out on a, some guy's flash boat down there in Palm Valley. And they were catching a bunch of redfish, and then Tim went back out with Bubba, and they were catching them in the creeks down uh, down there in the St. John's in Brackish Water. They are catching largemouth and redfish. Mm-hmm. And I said, dude, I can't take this crap no more. I said, I can't let them have all the fun. I want my redfish fillet. So I put in, I went off the Hexer Drive, which is my stomping ground, and I put in one of my... One of my creeks, I, ha- I think I've only put in there twice. It's not my normal places, but I always go up all up and down Hexer Drive. That's just the side of the river that I fish. And the mullet sucked at the launch. I thought I was going to be able to go to the launch, cast the net, get some mullet, and then head on my way. I only got three mullet at the launch. So I had to go down and around the corner where the feeder creeks were. Killed the mullet. Like two casts, and I had more than I knew what to do with. And uh, so I did that. And then while I had had line soaking, bam, got a, got my first red for the year. It was a little rat red. If you guys, uh, I put the video up last night. If you guys haven't seen it, it's the uh, catch and cook redfish on the grill. That was another thing. I, y'all been wanting me to do a catch and cook redfish, and it took me forever to catch one, but I finally did it. So if you haven't seen that, when we get done with here, go over to mine, and uh, I put it up last night. So it's the newest video. Uh, so I caught that one while I was messing around with the mullet, trying to get him out of the net. My Vexen rod, my inshore Vexen, went off, grabbed it, and it started peeling drag, and I instantly knew what I had. And it was a big old redfish. And how I had that one set up was I just had a jig head. It was a quarter-ounce jig head, neon. It was the Real Habit jig heads. They uh, made local right here in in uh, my hometown. And they sell them like, uh, at Browns Creek and all the local bait shops all along the river. Great, great jig head, very sharp. It was time to model my other ones for getting adults. So anyway, I just had a quarter ounce jig head, about a four ounce live or a four inch live finger mullet. Just had it soaking. I just, like once again, remember we were talking about you find those deep holes, and a lot of those big predator fish sit in those deep holes, waiting for bait fish to flow over the top of them as the tide runs. And that's what I did, and it turned out to be a 19 and a half inch redfish. Brought him home, laid him up. Put him in a foil pack and grilled him. I wish I had some onions and peppers, like I said in the video, that I put him on top of. That would have, that would just set it off. But I did have the Everglades on it. You, you cannot cook fish fillet without Everglades, unless you're frying it, of course. But even then, I put it in the batter. So that's been my red fish experience. Uh, Alex, you don't have video up yet of you caught two red fish the other day. Correct. For yeah, so I um... tell the stories. I haven't heard it yet. Bob hasn't heard it yet. I want to hear this. 
Yeah, so I went out, uh, like I said, uh, if you've seen my most recent video of me fishing Fort George, it was uh, it was rough, to say the least. I was battling um, the tide and 30-mile-an-hour winds. I got one bluefish within an hour of being there, and then the next seven hours, I didn't get anything. But I, I had gone out, and I said, I'm going to stick it out. I didn't get anything, but I still had a good time. Um, so I went out, I got in touch with a couple of buddies of mine, and another YouTuber, actually. Um and uh Matt, Matt, out the house and go fishing no mac tension fishing um went out with him i don't know if you guys he's he's got a, a smaller channel he's started recently um so he's the guy uh, that you went flounder gigging with no no that was a old uh an old friend of mine a uh that i used to work with actually when i used to work at dick sporting goods but um no so I, I went out with these two guys and they they know the creeks they they go kayak fishing. They, they know what they're doing. They, they know what to throw, how to throw it, where to throw it, you know, tides, the whole nine yards. I said, you guys take me out, show me what I'm doing wrong. Show me how I can do this better. So I went out and I was looking at, um, you know, the, the, the creeks and I'm, you know, trying to figure out for myself what was going on. And I was completely wrong. Cause I, I was talking with them and they're showing me I was wrong. But, uh, in the video that's going up Tuesday, Tuesday night, seven o'clock, I've got it set to uh, go up. Um, I uh, take the deeper out, and I find, like you were talking about, I find a you know a deep drop off, dropped off to about 12 foot, and um, I went to the opposite bank because there was a sandbar, and I just cast across the uh, you know the, the inshore there, the, the intercoastal the creekway, uh, live finger mullet, half ounce weight, two aught hook, and uh, just let it sit there for a little while, and uh, I had uh, I was limited out, I had two 21 inch redfish limited out within an hour of each other. Um, after finding that spot, getting the mullet in the cast net and, uh, let, letting the bait soak for just a little bit, man, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, nice, nice fish fillets. I prefer my redfish blackened. Uh, so I made some blackened, uh, redfish fillets last night with some, uh, mac and cheese and garlic mashed potatoes and Texas toast. And it was amazing. I'm going out again, hopefully soon. <laughs> and why was I not invited over for dinner? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was going. I, I mean, I love it black and too. That'll probably be my next thing. But I can't deviate from the plan. I promised the people grilled redfish, and that's what I gave. I hear so that. that's, what, that's what I did. And you sound just like me. I found a deep hole. I probably wasn't there ten minutes, and I had bam, bam, back to bite yep. hits. And then the tide stopped, and that was it. Uh, yep. uh, Albatross was talking about he's going to Fort George Inlet, which is a stomping grounds of me and get out the house, go fishing. And now apparently Alex is invading too. So, <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, but we we all do things a little bit different. Alex puts in on the east side. I put in on the west side where the boat ramp is. And usually like I'll put in, and like Alex was saying, you have to judge those tides to make it better for you. Uh, what I'll do is, if it's an outgoing tide, I'll use the tide to get me out, and I'll go towards uh, Huguenot Park, where all those little channels and sandbars and everything are at, and I'll go in there, and I'll fish the incoming, and I'll stay there, and when it's outgoing tide, or no, sorry, that's the outgoing tide, and I'll stay there and fish. When the tide starts coming back in, right at the tail end of it, and I'll come back and use the tide to get me back to the boat ramp to come in. And also, if you stay out there, especially during the summertime, I think we're a little bit past it now maybe not when the tide gets real high and you can still see those sandbars you'll see redfish like you know like how you see in the keys on those sandbars and little yep. packs cruising along those sandbars and you can take a shrimp on a jig head and flip it right out in front of them and you better hang on and also uh black drum have been known to be on top of those sandbars during high tide too so a little tip for yep. those that go out there if Absolutely. you hang in there just uh just try yep. to stay out just try to stay out of the way of the Jet skis and the wakeboarders yeah. and everything, because I don't know why it's just everybody's favorite place to go. I guess they think it's like an ocean, little ocean swimming pool area. But right, that's fine. When that big bull shark comes by, uh, that'll change your mind. I've seen one or two, and believe it or not, I've seen a barracuda out there in Fort George. And I ain't talking about a little one foot barracuda. I'm talking about like a four foot ocean barracuda. I didn't know. I had no idea they came in that close. I've seen them off oh, the yeah. wrecks and stuff all the time. I didn't know they came in shore. That was the biggest barracuda I've ever seen in shore. Huh. With that Fort George Inlet. So don't be dangling your toes off your kayak. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, we used to fish the bridge out there a lot and catch, you know, I mean, just everything right around the bridge. And a lot of times you'd have like a little small black drum or something like that or a little baby sheep's head. And it would it would just take off screaming and then come back bit in half. And that was a lot of time a barracuda, uh, sometimes a shark. Uh, but Albatross too. check out uh, like Google Maps uh, satellite view of it, uh, of Fort George Inlet. Because, uh, like, we're all talking about those sandbars and those deep holes. Check out, like, a low tide version of it, and you can see where those deep holes are and where those sandbars are really good on that. I mean, you it, it shows every every bit of it. Yeah, I'm not going to say where, but I have my favorite spot out there. And if uh, I catch any of you out there, I'm going to cut you. No, no, for real, though. It, <laughs> I'm not going to say where out there, but there's a spot where it's shallow and it just drops off into a deep hole. And on the incoming tide, that water kind of flows over that hole like a uh, kind of like an underwater waterfall kind of deal. And all the mullet come pouring over it and it tumbles them around and they get confused and the sea trout just rush in there and tear them up. I haven't caught any redfish out of the spot, but I've killed the sea trout out of there along with some uh, jacks and other stuff like that. So look for things like that. You're where just it's real. It's just a flat and it's probably two to three feet. And it just drops off into like an eight foot hole. That's what you're looking for. And that's where those predators are going to be. And you can't get them until that current gets moving to get those bait fish all stirred up. Can you really see me now? Oh, I can see you very well. <laughs> I fixed the light bulb. Nice. Well, is that your lucky fishing shirt? But not your lucky light bulb. I see that. Right. Don't wash. Yeah. Just it's like not, uh, not it's really a pain. shirt. Yeah, so Bubba, go ahead and tell us about your brackish water redfish experience that you had the other day. And uh, well, yeah, what, that's what uh, you think your key was to actually, you know, kind of separating getting redfish from largemouth. That's yeah. I mean, uh, you know, so I went through the story earlier about how it was just an absolute wreck on what actually happened catching it, where you know it got me all losing the reel, torn up, and everything. But what we were throwing that day and. Uh, you know, because Tim was asking me about it. He he went like Joe was on somebody's flats book and got his first redfish. So he he called me up and he's like, "Hey man, do you, you want to go redfish?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll I'll take you. Let's go." And he's asked me what to bring, and I was like, "Well, you can catch them on a ton of stuff, but right now, uh, you know, first thing you want to tie on is a spook that looks like a mullet." And that was really our key was was imitating mullet because uh, I caught a bunch on a crank looking like a mullet too. Uh, we were throwing incoming tide shallow fishing pools right by deep pools right by grass uh but it was they were they were keying up on mullet you know i tried throwing a few different things the only other thing that we caught one on was uh was like a texas rig crawfish um you know looking like a fiddler crab but mullet was the key for that uh i was throwing a uh i think mine was actually a bomber uh, but it was, it was like silver um I think Tim's was maybe like a bone color. I can't remember, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was all about the mullet imitation there. Um, and that was, I caught a, went night fishing out at Fort George Inlet probably three weeks ago now and caught, you know, a few out there, but everything, the same thing was, was either on, you know, live finger mullet or mullet imitation. Um, so that, that for me lately has been, been the key. Cause every time I've thrown, we were talking about the shrimp earlier, every time I've thrown, you know, like a shrimp or a shrimp imitation, it's not reds. So I'm catching whiting. I'm catching jack. I'm catching stuff that I'm not. I'm not singling out those reds. Mullet has been the key for singling out reds for me lately. Yeah, there's another fellow uh, that I ran into during my trip. He was in a Hobie and had a wrap on it, and he was mostly after flounder. But he said the only thing he could catch anything on was mullet. Well, all this mullet run right now, that's what these fish are keyed in on. And that redfish I caught, you think when I went to cleaning, every time I catch a redfish, I always see what they're eating. That way I know kind of what to use for bait for next time. And when I cut him open, you think it'd be full of finger mullet, and he did not have the first kind of bait fish in his stomach at all. And he didn't have shrimp in there either. What he had in there were baby stone crabs. His stomach was just full of baby stone crabs. And I, you can tell it was a big, giant whole can claws that they had on them. So yeah. that was interesting. So maybe I think I think Gulp makes a crab. So they I'm do. Like, they they do. Yeah, they do. Uh, what's up, Jason? Fine. Um, 
you talk about the A-Rig. I got one for that that I have caught them on before. Uh, but talk about stone crabs. I've done really good on stone crabs, uh, Goat Island, because there's a bunch of little stone crabs around there. Um, using them, uh, I've done really good over there. Uh, but yeah, Gulp makes a crab. Um, I've never tried it. I don't know how well it works, but I imagine it will work as good as anything else. Don't for uh, me to try. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, I, I wouldn't ima- see any reason it wouldn't work. Everything else, Gulp works, right? Uh, well, I mean, you like they say you want to match the hatch. And apparently, that's what that particular redfish was keying in on was crabs. But at the same time, you still ate my mullet. So, you know, something right. to try and even get out of the house. He just asked the same question. Anyone ever use those gold crabs? Now, I don't know. if Guys, if you're watching this and you have used them before, head over to the chat. Let us know how they work. Uh, yeah, he's going to try them. I'm going to try them. I mean. Yeah, might as well, right? He ain't yeah. hurt anything. That's going to be my yeah. next trip. I want to go back. I want to go to Fort George Inlet, and it's going to be an artificial only trip. I'm not, uh, unless things get really bad and I'm really hungry for some sea trout and red. But I'm gonna try to throw just artificial. I'm gonna try to throw just my Miradine, Gulp, Topwater, all that crap, and maybe some crabs. I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe some Gulp crabs. If anything, I'm sure Browns has got them. You know, you stop by Browns Fish Camp. That's like my favorite place to go to. Uh, when I stop yeah. by, you get a bucket of ice for a dollar. I mean, come on, that's yeah. better than the ice machine. It actually talk works. about that A rig. You talk about the A-Rig. Uh, Joe knows I love it. Uh, Live Target makes a little like miniature A-Rig. It's called a bait ball. Man, that I've caught trout and reds on that thing, too. I've, I've, I've caught everything. Don't destroy it. Dude, I, they, they do, but the, you can get, like, I mean, the paddle tails on that thing are like an inch and a half, two inch long. You can get, a like, a replacement pack of those for, you know, for dirt cheap. Uh, the trout tear it up. The reds don't really do too much to it, but trout destroy it. I think... Uh, for the A-Rig, Jason was talking about it. He had no success with it either. I think it's one of those cases. It's going to be more of a trout bait than anything else. And if you can find a school of trout, I don't know why you couldn't bring back like four at a time. That that would be awesome. Yeah, like, I mean, like I don't four, see why not. Like four 18, 19-inch trout on that right. thing. Yeah. Oh, man, you almost done one, one hit. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just had a holiday pass and get out the fish. It was, uh, get out the house and go fish. We're just talking about this. Like Fort George Inlet is one of those places where there's jet skiers and wakeboarders and like just every everybody and their brother goes out there. And God help you if you go fishing in one of them places on Labor Day weekend or Memorial oh, no. Day weekend and things like that during the, any kind of holiday during the summer. It's a three day weekend. You are going to have a bad day at the boat ramp. Like I I, I don't even bother going to the boat ramp. So that's what we're going to talk about is how do you beat the traffic on the water during the holidays, like the three-day weekends when you know the ramp is going to be just packed? My idea of beating it is going to the Kingfish boat ramp on Hexter Drive with a cooler, a lounge chair, and a video camera, and watching all those people that just bought a boat trying to back down a trailer for the first time. That's how I beat fishing on a weekend. I just embrace it. Just just embrace the suck. Just you know, instead of going fishing, just laugh at everybody else that's trying to go for the first time. Uh, no, the way I beat it is is I get the kayak. I get the kayak and I go to an unpopular uh, kind of tourist spot, I guess you could say, or a water skiing spot or hot spot. You know the boat ramps on the St. John's are gonna be packed, like the main boat ramps. Hexer drive, all the kayak launches are gonna be full. So Go find you a pond, a backwater creek, a, uh, a canal, something like that. That way you can still get your fishing in. You don't have to deal with the traffic. It, I mean, you, you want to deal with the traffic on the road. You want to deal with the boat traffic. And God forbid, don't go to Kingsley on 4th of July weekend. You will not get a line wet at all. Uh, I, don't even like to fish the, I don't even like to fish the regular weekend. I'm, I'm fortunate enough where uh, I get Wednesdays and Thursdays off once in a while and also uh, Monday and Tuesday in there, too. So I try to go on a weekday. Like, uh, I'm going to be fishing Rodman here on a Friday here. I know a lot of people will have Friday off, but it's not going to be nowhere near as bad as it would be a Saturday or, or Sunday morning. So it's a lot easier for me to get out there on a week or on a weekday, and there's less people to deal with. I know Captain Dave with Captain Dave's Fishing the Charter Boat. He likes to go. He doesn't like to fish weekends either for that very same fact. And I know he puts in at on the other side of the river, like where Jack's Beach and all that stuff is. So it's even worse. 
So that, that's what I, I mean. That's what I try to do. And uh, but at the same time, holidays can be a good thing. Uh, Mikey Balls Fishing made a very good point. He says the two best days to go fishing, to go to the lake, are Thanksgiving and Christmas Day. That's true. There is going to yep. be no one on that lake or body of water those two days. You will have the whole place to yourself. So, I mean, Thanksgiving is one thing. You could go Thanksgiving morning. If you're not the one doing the cooking, you could go Thanksgiving morning. Go get you some fall bass fishing in or go get you some fall sea trout in. I know all November I will be killing the sea trout. You guys be looking for that video. I can't wait myself. And then uh, Christmas, celebrate Christmas Eve. Go ahead and do your exchange the night of Christmas Eve, and then you can go out to the lake or the river Christmas, and I will guarantee you, you will be the only soul at the boat ramp. If not, then you're going to have some other hardcore fellows right there with you. So that makes hey. it a little bit better. So that's, that's, that's my approach uh, to dealing with the weekend. I don't know if we have anybody that uh, lives around the Palm Coast area, and I really hate to give this away. But there is so many canals all down in Palm Coast, saltwater and freshwater, and they're both just packed full of uh, fish. So that's one of those places you could, if you knew somebody that lived on those canals, and there's also a little area you can pack a car or a truck down to, launch your kayak, and you have the whole canal to yourself. You want to fight all the weight borders and skiers and everything out on the on the main bodies of water. Yeah, uh, you talk about Christmas, talk about doing it on Christmas Eve, man. The the yellow mouth video I did last year was Christmas Eve, actually. And the only other people in the water was guys running crab traps. Uh, Christmas Eve is a good day because uh, everybody's, you know, they're getting ready for Christmas. They're all sitting at home, not doing anything. That's But I do the same thing. I got a couple little spots that are off the beaten path that I drop the kayak in on those kind of crazy holidays. Uh, there's That's whenever I went. You know, this past one, I was saying I was bass fishing and did pretty good. Was uh, was Labor Day, uh, dropped the kayak in a little little spot uh, by the house over here that uh, I've never even seen another kayak or giant thing on it. Uh, but that that's yeah, I do the same exact thing. I get off the beaten path. Uh, usually, I'm not. You talking about fighting boat ramp traffic, man? That holiday boat ramp traffic. Ed. Well, like I said, you can. It's like a double edged sword. You can uh, you can use it and just go entertain yourself, get you a buddy and a cooler and some drinks, and go chill out the boat ramp and make you a, a funny boat ramp fails video to put up on YouTube for that day. Uh, Alex, what, what, like, what'd you do Fourth of July and you know uh, Labor Day weekend and everything? Um, did, you, did you just avoid it all together or what? So Labor Day was the day that I went to Fort George and had that terrible day of fishing. Um, oh, that was you, you fought it. I I knew better. I really I know better. I do. Um, so I went out. I tried doing it. It completely backfired. I'm not exaggerating when I say there was at least twenty, maybe twenty five people jet skiing out there, um, like in one little area, not like you know going up and down and spaced out. Like they were, they were ripping around each other and jumping off each other's wakes. And there was boats and there was. It, it it was it was just a mess. Um, what I did for Fourth uh, of July was a lot smarter. Um, I ended up uh, last year. I went to um, Lake Bethesda Park uh, up in Jacksonville on the north uh, northwest side. Uh, but then this year, I think I went. Uh, I think I, I think I did the same thing. I think I just went pond fishing. You know, I you know I just I avoided the big areas. I just went to the little you know local. Like, like I was talking about, you know, lakes behind the banks and then next to warehouses and the, the retention ponds and stuff like that, golf course, you know, whatever. I just went there and fished there, and, I, I you know, I, I didn't have as much of a problem. All right. Well, guys, it's definitely been over an hour. We're getting there, so we're going ahead and kind of slow things down, wrap it up. We're going to open it up to Q&A. If you have any questions specifically you want to ask us, uh, be it about a certain area, saltwater fishing, freshwater fishing, rigs, tackle, kayaks, boats, you know, if you just want to pick our brain or, you know, you want to give some info yourself to help other people out, you know, please do put it over there in the chat. And be sure before you sign off and leave here, you know, leave us a thumbs up. It's what keeps us going. It's what keeps us spring coming back here every month to do this. And uh, we definitely thank Alex for, you know, filling in for Timmy. You know, even though that would be entertaining, with seeing Timmy on here with some big Ray-Bans just kind of like looking around like this, not knowing where the computer screen is. 
Jeezel. Yeah, we just let him think that the uh, podcast is still going two hours later is what we do with him. <laughs> well, I'm too, uh, you know, talk about asking questions and stuff like this. We are building like a little community here. If any local guys, I don't know about uh, about Joe, any local guys, uh, you know, that are in here all the time, you ever want to go fish, I'm open to, you know, to going out there with you. We can go take the kayaks out or you can come with my boat. My boat ain't nothing fancy. but uh, yeah, but sure ain't nothing fancy. No, but it damn sure catches fish too. Jason's wanting to know how the pond's going. Uh, I've been leaving the summertime now. I really haven't been fishing the pond. I'm trying to, it's, the water temperature's real hot. I don't want to stress out the bass. And I don't know where all my newborn fingerlings went. All the new bass that were like four inches long, I haven't seen a one. They've all disappeared. I don't know oh. if they <laughs> are doing really good at hiding or they went deep. Or they're start they're like really hiding really good in the palace, or they got all got eat. I don't know. I, I snuck I, in there. I snuck in there when Joe was out of town and dumped some mud fish in there. That's where uh, they all went. <laughs> hey, I do have some invasive species that showed up in the pond though. Like I did not put in there, what and uh, they're they're minnows. They're them gambusias, the the mosquito fish. Huh. Hi. Hey. That they have found their way in there, be it birds or whatever. Yeah. Which is that, that's just kind of cool. It's kind of interesting how. I have nothing to do with that. I'm a long way away from any big body of water, and then all of a sudden, minnows show up in my pond that I didn't put in there. Uh, life will find a way. Life will find a way. <laughs> exactly. uh, the bass are doing good. They're 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 still roaming around the edges and little wolf packs going around. They're getting longer, but they're not fat. They're you know they're kind of more shaped like a torpedo right now than a football. But uh, I got a feeling that's going to change. Uh, the bluegills have been spawning like crazy, and there's just hundreds of thousands of blue little year of the young bluegill about an inch and a half long all over the pond so when they grow to be about three four inches long those bass are going to be have plenty of food to eat and get fat and hopefully they'll get bigger which means next year when they spawn they'll produce more eggs they'll be a better spawn and better recruitment so that's what I'm, that's what i'm hoping for next year uh i'm wanting a couple years to go by and let them get pretty big and then I'm going to add uh, some some more, a different strain. I'm going to add some, like, uh, bass from the St. John's. Like, if I get a big, you know, eight, seven pounder, I'm going to put those genetics in the pond. That would be great. But I got to let them get big enough for that eight pounder won't eat them. That's, that's the problem. Right now, they're, they're, they're about 13, 14 inches long like, in, in, that, in that area. But still aggressive. They'll, like, hit shoelaces if you throw them in there. They're, 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 they're crazy aggressive still. But they've been uh, hiding out in deep water in the afternoons, and you'll see them. It's weird. During the middle of the day is when they hunt. Like around 3 o'clock, you'll see them roaming the banks. And then when the sun starts going down, when they should be out, they go deep. It's, it's weird. The bluegill have got huge. I guarantee you I have multiple one-pound, one-and-a-half-pound bluegill in there right now. Uh, when the feeder goes off, it looks like piranhas. They're, they're throwing water like two feet in the air when they hit the feet. So I'm probably going to do a video about that soon. I'm going to get some... Uh, Crickets or worms or something like that, because for some reason they won't hit beetle spins or nothing very rarely, and, but they will eat live bait. And uh, I'm gonna try to get some bluegills and show you those guys. See, show you the, those guys how big they're doing. Love showing off the pond. Love seeing how it's going. I love watching it because I learn something every time I go down there. And uh, Bubba, I, I want to do something with you and me. I want you to come up here to my neck of the woods, up here uh, on the Saint Saint Mary's River. I want us to go out and we need to go catch the catfish, buddy. Let's do it. Let's do I need, it. I was I telling. Need, uh, I need about six or eight channel cats to put in the pond. I need a cleanup yeah. crew because that's where I clean my redfish and stuff at, and I throw the remains in the pond. I mean, the bluegills peck on it and everything, but a channel cat would make short work of that, and they, they don't get too bad. They don't overpopulate, and plus they're tasty. And okay, so, so I want yeah. to some channel cat and some uh, red breast sunfish to add to the pond. Well, I'm pretty good at both of those. I was telling uh, Alex, I was telling Joe, he needs to get him a deeper so he can map out his pond and see where they're all hiding at, you know. Or, or I could just launch the skeeter in there. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just uh, troll around the whole thing in a couple minutes. There yeah, with the, side, with the side scan on. Oh man, that'd be perfect. Uh, right. When the water when the water clears up, uh, dang, I missed get out of the house, go fishing, leaving. My bad. I'm sure he'll hopefully find out that. Say goodbye. Uh, when the water clears up, uh, which is usually when the, it starts getting cold, is a sad thing. I'm going to put the GoPro on my head. I got my scuba equipment, and I'm going to dive the pond 
and uh, let you guys see all the underwater view of how everything's doing. Here's kind of an underwater view. Uh, you'll see something that looks like that swimming around, but bigger. How uh, yeah. how clear is it, like, normally? Like, whenever it does clear up, how clear does it get? Oh, it can get, like, six feet. Like, six six feet of visibility. It gets real clear during the wintertime. There's not as much rain, so there's no sediment. And uh, I fertilize during the uh, summertime, which gives it a plankton bloom, and it makes all the little microscopic, you know, deals for right. the baby fish that hatch to eat. That's why you fertilize during the summer. So that's man. If that ain't enough information on the home pond, I don't know what is. Jason, I hope that satisfies you. Uh, anybody else got any questions out there? Like I said, me and Bubba were planning different trips. Uh, I'm gonna like. I'd love to have Bubba come up here to the St. Mary's River and fish it with me. Uh, me, Bubba, and Timmy are gonna go after hybrid striped bass here when the fall gets, and we definitely gotta return back to the Swanee River to catch a Swanee bass. Hey, after uh, that joker hooked himself with that redfish, I'm I'm fishing the front with you. He can have the back to himself. Who, Tim? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You talking about? Oh yeah, they're gonna flop around way more than redfish. Yeah. Right. So he can have the back to himself. I'm coming up front with you. I ain't taking no stray hook from Tim. Yeah, Alex. Uh, any upcoming fishing plans you got that you? Um, not a ton. I actually just got texted uh, by the guy that um that i that i went out flounder gigging with he's out at fort george and uh, he said that the mullet are running so thick he can't see the sandbars to uh actually gig flounder because they're, they're running too thick he said he had to throw at least 50 of them out the boat because they kept jumping in his canoe so that's insanity i, I that makes me want to go out there and go fishing yeah. but uh i definitely want to do uh, a lot more i i want to hit as much kayak fishing as i possibly can because i hear that you know trout and sheep's head and whatnot are really good in the uh, winter time the problem with that is i hate the cold weather i can't stand cold weather so as soon as it gets cold i'm going to be uh ooh, that's uh, i'm gonna well, it's gonna be a lot of uh magnet fishing videos <laughs> or well, something you're, you're lucky that you live in florida so we get exactly, like four exactly. days of cold weather and then you're good to go again but you heard it here first guys Bait Shop Talk Live. We get live updates as they happen. That's right. All, Fishing all reports. Water. Fishing reports as it's happening. As it's happening on the water. That got me thinking, though. Is it, isn't it? that crazy how the freaking fish know that that's coming? How I was saying earlier that the only thing that I could separate the reds from everything else with was mullet pattern, and then seven days later, mullet run is on. Oh, mullet run is definitely on, and it should be going till probably early November. So definitely key in on that while you can. You guys get out there and wet a line for sure. Uh, Saltwater is definitely on, uh, mm -hmm. except for the poor fella that we were just talked to that was from Utah. Uh, uh, you want to buy a plane ticket if you want to catch yeah. that bite. Sorry, <laughs> bud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but he gets to go catch cool stuff that we don't get to catch, you know, like the trout. And, I don't know if they have salmon, like a salmon species in Utah or not. I know they got cold water species. That's something else I missed out on this year. Usually I go to the mountains every year and go catch rainbow trout. And I didn't get to do that this year either. Stupid. Well, you, you did mention it, so I'm I, I must stress how much I want to get back out there and uh, get on those swannies. So I, I got to take another run at it. Yeah, and uh, so does that mean you and me are going to go out Christmas and catch yellowmouth trout? <laughs> hey, we can. I'm, I'm down for that. Go out to Goat Island. Yeah, man. Apparently there's a goat island where Zoffinger lives too. He did. A I saw that. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. His goat island is uh, apparently way better than ours. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, ours doesn't have goats anymore. Uh, Rusty B says, uh, you know, he reads a lot about like uh, lower jaw damage from grabbing a fish. Um, you know, so holding them different like that. I know uh everybody's kind of different on it i think uh you know generally i i try to baby anything that i would consider a big fish uh in that yeah. kind of respect you know if me, i'd say like two two and a half and up i would I, mine's probably a little heavier but not much you know if it's something that's like three plus if i, if I would call it like oh that's a good fish you know if it's like three to five then it's getting it's starting to get the baby treatment there Anything that I don't consider a dink, I, I try to take care of. Uh, you know, if anything, if you hold them vertical, like straight up and down, yeah, you know, you're you'll, you're pretty pretty much good. But if you're, it don't don't just crack their jaw. If you're going to turn your hand, put you know, put your hand underneath their tail, hold them up. That's exactly. It. Yeah, I use uh, I use fish grips a lot. 
Fight um, lines, Jason. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Jason. We'll see you next time. We're fixing this. Get out of here too. Sorry, yeah. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Alex. No, 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 no worries, no worries. And but I, I use fish grips, which I get a lot of flack for. People are like, oh, you know, don't be afraid of the fish. They're not going to bite. Da, da, da. It's not that I'm afraid of the fish or that I'm afraid of getting bit. I, I have no problem with that, but I've been told by a lot of uh, marine biologists and, you know, pe people that study these fish scientifically that fish grips help protect the fish. They reduce the stress on the fish. It's better for their jaws and uh, it's just better overall. So that, that's what I do. But I, I get a lot of flack for that. I'll tell you what, a lot of people <laughs> give, give me uh, crap for that. And it's, uh, it's it's a little daunting sometimes. Yeah, uh, geez, I mean, you know, there, there's going to be haters out there. I mean, it's just really, you know, how, what you what you're comfortable with. Saltwater, you're very hard pressed to find me putting my thumb in anything saltwater's mouth. Yeah, I was laughing at Tim. He was like, "Are you lipping that red?" I'm like, "Yeah, man, I'm lipping it." <laughs> I'll I'll lip a red to a certain size, and then after like you know, when they start getting a twenty something inch range, and they start getting some. Yeah, they start getting some real teeth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nah, it's got to be over the limit for me to worry about it. Yeah, but you're 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 grabbing them like you would like a big blue cat or something in the corner where they don't have any teeth. Yeah, that's the trick, guys. If you want to lip reds, uh, that's what I was telling Timmy because he was asking me about lipping uh, that 26 incher. Uh, got to slide down in the corner of the mouth and kind of grab the gills up, like gill plate underneath it too, because uh, the thing with them is you know they. It's not as much the teeth as much as whenever you get the teeth and they start thrashing. Uh, that's that's when they get you. So I'll I'll lip you know anything that's that's slot basically. If it gets bigger than that, I won't lip it. But slide down to the corner of the mouth and they don't have teeth on it, and you're you're all right. Yeah, even a large mouth when they start getting big enough, their teeth are like yeah. you know like eighty grit sandpaper. It it'll tear a thumb up, you know. But that's all what right. I want to have at the end of a tournament day. I want my thumb to be bleeding. That means I had a good day. Right. Um, not to pick on Timmy any more than what we already have, but I think we ought to all get together and get him like a uh, species chart. That way he can start finally oh my goodness. identifying fish. <laughs> well, <laughs> Timmy, Timmy's all calling new. spots. Timmy's calling spots blue runners and whatnot. <laughs> it's all new to him, you know. Yeah. I know he's from it's Kentucky, new, but I like to pick, I like to pick on him about. That's like my one thing I like to mess with him about. I did have him catch his first gar with me. That was the first time he's caught a gar. He caught like a probably two and a half, uh, three foot long nose gar, and he's like, "Is that an alligator gar?" <laughs> so uh, for, for those, you gotta go to the Okawaha. They got him like six to eight feet there. Yeah, that's what I told him. I was like, "Nah, man, we don't we don't have alligator gar. That's a long nose gar." Uh, but yeah, so not to pile on him, but he did ask me, "Is that an alligator gar?" Yeah, I think we need to change that. We need to start going after some different species, but uh, that can hold on for my tournament in saltwater. I was gonna go surf fishing after work, but finances won't allow that. So sadly, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to hold off on that. But I'm starting to be like Alex. I was on uh, online the other day and I was looking at surf rods. So I don't have an old lady to worry about spending my money with. <laughs> I can just go ahead and oh, click man. add to cart and without any consequences. But I, I found <laughs> a, uh, a nice surf rod for I think thirty bucks. It's like a two piece. It's ten feet. Yeah. And I'm going to pair that with a uh, Cast King spinning reel, like a four thousand series, and I should be set. That'll be my first surf rod. Really? I didn't know you didn't have one, man. That's uh. If you want to go before you get that one, I got a few of them. That's uh, luckily for me, I do have an old lady to spend money on and two kids to spend money on. But I came from saltwater fishing before. I, I've only been bass fishing like heavy, like two years uh, before that. I hadn't bass fished much since I was a kid. But I've got two surf rods that are over ten feet, and then a couple of other small ones that are like eight to ten foot. But I've got one well, that's I got one that's fourteen, man. <laughs> I'm good. I don't need a telephone pole. I'm just kind of surf curious right now. I guess you could say it's it's, uh, it's, it's it, fun. Well, you know, I, I, well, I grew up. I grew up doing it in high school, and you you only needed a seven foot rod because if you wanted to catch whiting, I mean, they were just on yeah. the back side of the back side of the uh, the surf. But you know, if you want to start getting into more like drum and redfish and things like that, then yeah, you need a surf rod to get it up past the yeah. swell and everything. That's why I'm looking at it. You know, if anything, I'll get one, the cheapo, and see how it goes for there. Like I said, I'm not going to do it. I don't do it not even once a month, hardly. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. It's a lot more relaxing. I can tell you that. It's a lot yeah. easier to have everything in the bed of the truck and go. Yeah, yeah. I got to buy some more PVC, too. It's easy. It's quick. It's, uh, I, I, 
he was saying it gets addicting. Well, Alex, you do it for a few years, you'll get bored of it too, though, because it's a lot of cast staying there and wait too. Yeah, I, I, you know, recently got maybe two or three years ago, I got back into bass fishing hardcore, and with tournament fishing, it's even more of a challenge. And I don't know what it is about that. Just trying to figure them out makes it more appealing to me than like saltwater. Saltwater, I've kind of like find a hole, wait for the current, use good bait. Saltwater's done. Well, yeah. bass, they're always moving, always something's changing. And plus, I like to win. I'm very competitive, so I'm trying to find them. But uh, I think we're going to wrap this up. We are way over our time limit. Uh, we used to try to keep it about an hour, and we're way over that. So we thank every single one of y'all for joining us tonight. It's been a really great base shop talk. We've been I've been watching a little washing now, and the numbers are higher than they've ever been. So we thank every one of you guys for joining us. Be sure to join us next month. Uh, next month will be October, beginning around Halloween time, redfish, and sea trout time for sure. Rusty, thank you for joining. I, I was really hoping you was going to be there with us. I'm glad you enjoyed the show. So be looking for each one of our channel's videos. If you're not subscribed to our channels, go ahead and check us out. It's Bubba Outdoors and Alex with 90 Fishing or 904 Fishing Outdoor. Uh, so check Alex out. He's got some really cool stuff. And like I said, if you have any questions about it deeper or you're thinking about getting one, Alex's channel is definitely the one to watch for uh, deeper info. And we definitely appreciate him having us. And thank you all again. Be sure to hit that thumbs up button before you take off. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Remember, we do more intense more. We'll see you out there next time. Take care. See you.